Shaw TV, your local voice. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out. My name is Guy Dornsey. Um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I spent a long time living in England before I came out here about 27 years ago. I now live in the Yellow Point area with my wife, Carolyn Herriot. What you're about to see here is um, capital C Colossal. It's a really big presentation. Because this book, it's about this book that I wrote called Journey to the Future, which is the story of a young man called Patrick Wu who goes to Vic who gets to visit Vancouver in the year 2032 by the magic of fiction and gets to spend four days there to find out you know, what it's like when it's become one of the world's greenest cities. Um, I've been living in Canada for 27 years, um, 25 years in Victoria, very involved with social change, environmental change. I've been a, basically a self-employed troublemaker all my life. <laughs> um, and because this is big, I think we should jump straight in. So this is in two parts. This is part one which covers a lot of the stuff around building a new economy. Part two is covering the climate crisis and the solutions to the climate crisis and the rediscovery of purpose on the planet. So in part one, Patrick Wu, my young man, goes to Vancouver in the year 2032 by the magic of fiction, and he discovers a city that has a strong democracy, renewable energy, affordable housing, the recovery of nature, a new hope and a new story. The climate crisis is continuing because you can't change the laws of physics up in the atmosphere, but he's seeing there's a strong, happy neighborhoods, and there's a cooperative economy that's evolving some way beyond capitalism. So the question is, like, how does all that get to happen in such a short period of time, which is what the book explores? And he spends his four days asking questions, like, how do you do this? How do you do that? And, but to find out really how it happens, I want to go way back. I mean, way, way, way back to the beginning of time and the origins of our life in the universe that took 14 billion years to create the miracle of today's existence. So this is a selfie. This is ourselves as stardust. We're made from conscious, self-organizing stardust. And that's an important theme when you come to the end of part two of this presentation. And so right back to the Big Bang and the massive you know, creation of matter, you know, all of the first atoms were formed you know, during the first you know, four billion years of existence. The gold in my wedding ring is like formed in a supernova explosion nine billion years ago. Out of the first atoms, they self-organize and form these prebiotic molecules. They get together and say, let's become a molecule. They create things like DNA, that are enabling molecules to sort of form organisms. And then we w move into the world of the multicellular organisms, the incredible creativity of nature. And then we have planet Earth forming with the planet with the, called Pangaea at the time. And then this explosion of, of, of creativity, which we call evolution, all of the, the leaves, the insects, the birds, the bees, the humans that exist, came out of this incredible evolutionary process, all the life in the oceans. And then life nervously crawls out onto the land. And then we're moving ahead. And then we're in the age of the mammoths, just before you know, we come to North America. And then suddenly we have our own, we can see ourselves directly here. We can recognize ourselves in the chimpanzee. All of our ancestors behave like this. They all behave like this, mostly, when they're on the farm. Then we can, uh, what do I, how do I put words to this, create such incredibly modern cities. And we can also sit and meditate and consider the nature of who we are. These are the self-organizing atoms that are doing this. We can also go up into space and ponder reality from outside our planet. And yet, we're also coming to this, which is we're trashing the planet. We're still abusing it. We're letting, you know, this kind of clear-cut forestry is still happening on Vancouver Island today as we speak. Um, it's just trees this size being cut down. And, you know, 100 years ago, we were proud to cut trees down like that. Were, yes, what a heroic thing. We've cut down this massive tree. Let's have a party and break out the beer. And yet, when you take that impulse and look what's happening today, this is out on the west coast of Vancouver Island, the impact on our planet of our craziness of technology and our confidence in what we're doing. Meanwhile, our population has just gone bananas. There's 10,000 years worth of development there, and just suddenly leaping up, another 200,000 people every day being added to the planet. Now we may get stabilization at the end of this century at 11 billion, and then start to decline. And in the oceans, we're seeing a you know, massive impact of overfishing, where you know, the percentage of species exploited, overexploited, or collapsed was 0% in 1950 and is 87% and above now, just because of overfishing in the ocean. 
And on the current trends, there'll be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050, which is like fairly alarming. Is you know, like when I say this to young people, they get really freaked out. Can this really be? So also we're and I'll finish this gloom and doom bit very rapidly. Rapidly. So we're driving creatures to extinction as our population grows. And when you look at it in the big picture, because we live very gradually day by day, but the species are going and they're really suffering because of our impacts. And then we have all our use of energy and leading to the climate crisis. So what is it all about? Like, what's going on? We have this m phenomenal potential as humans and we seem to be making a mess of things. And, we, and we're worshiping at the altar of GDP. There are more people you know, worshiping GDP than going to church these days. So I'd rename GDP gross depletion of the planet, or rather Patrick in the future finds an economist describing it as gross depletion of the planet. And why do we cut down the rainforests? To raise cattle to make hamburgers. Then we have what we're doing to the sharks. You know, we're catching them. Why do we kill off the sharks? To make shark fin soup for Chinese weddings, which is luckily now starting to decline. And then we take the albatross, which breeds for life. They're, 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 sorry, they mate for life. They're a lot more loyal than a lot of us are. <laughs> but they raise their chicks on Midway Island surrounded by plastic and the chicks eat the plastic and they die full of plastic. So something severely wrong with the way we're approaching things here. At the same time, we have this impulse to want to love our planet, to care for it, to try and do things differently. So when Patrick you know, is in the present time before he goes to the future, it's because of these dilemmas that he wants to say, to go to the future and see what would it be like when we're successfully tackling all these problems. And he sees all these grave fundamental problems. We're facing a democracy crisis, especially south of the border in America. There's an economic crisis coming. We didn't solve any of the major problems that caused the last financial crash. Um, there's an affordable housing crisis out here with houses going for ridiculous sums of money. There's an ecological crisis as well as the climate crisis. There's a, the climate crisis I just mentioned. There's a crisis of poverty, despair, and loneliness that doesn't get in the headlines because it is lonely. And there's a loss of community accompanying that, when neighbors no longer connect the way they used to do. And on top of that, there's a sense of like loss of direction and purpose. We're no longer all lined up behind monotheism or behind we believe in the god Baal or whatever it is. We don't know what we're doing. So when you take all this lot, it's pretty overwhelming. That's a big bundle of crises to put all together. So like it's like, whoa, how can I handle all that? So the question that what Patrick is facing when he comes to the future is like, how can we, what people before he got there have said, can we put all this into one pot and cook up some sort of a wonderful feast? So there's the feast. As a result of this, we can achieve climate stability, healthy democracy, affordable housing, and all these other great things. So, and then when he gets to the future, when he has to summarize after four days, what's he fundamentally found? Just three fundamental things. Firstly, the power that comes with having a positive vision is really quite amazing. The, the process of having a vision that drives you and makes you want to follow it through. So Carl Sagan, the cosmologist, said that the visions we offer our children shape their future. It matters what those visions are. If our youngsters have visions of collapse and doom, which is what they're absorbing at the moment, that's what they're going to sort of shape the future with. So we don't want visions of the future you know, the way Woody Allen sees them. We want them with the kind of determination that this poster for the big climate march in New York expresses. Second thing he found was that we simply need to organize together around the power of a new vision. Nothing new in the universe here, the same organizational methods we've used to achieve everything else. And the third thing he finds, there's a thing called a new theory of something called syntropy that provides a deep unifying principle and a new story to keep Woody Allen happy. So let's go back to 2008 now, when the last big financial crash, when you know, the Occupy movement got organized, there was a lot of distress going on, Occupy Wall Street, and, but it failed due to the absence of positive practical solutions. It was basically saying, well, let's stop capitalism, or let's stop greed, and it doesn't work. So then, um, when the next financial crash happened, which is coming up soon, some people said, well, let's do it again. Let's occupy again. We need to do this again. And somebody said, no, no, no. Wait a minute. Let's stop and think. Do this more practical. And they dreamed up a thing called the Omega Days. So Patrick found this out by people telling him how Vancouver got to be where it is. And in the Omega Days, there are five main themes which I'm coming to in a second, each of which has five posit pr positive practical solutions. So you've got a platform that's really solid you're campaigning on here. So O stands for open democracy. M stands for meaningful work. E stands for a new economy. G stands for a green future. 
And A stands for affordable living and also for affable living. So then with that platform of a really solid sense of practical proposals, they can embark on the Omega days, and there's a lot of you know, street action that happens. But another key theme in the book is that this is really important to emphasize the power of nonviolence in doing all this, to keep away from the street rowdies who want to go out and sort of smash someone's head. Because nonviolence is a far greater strength than any amount of cudgels and clubs and tear gas and stuff like the other, right? And so here's um, Martin Luther King saying that nonviolence means avoiding not only external violence, but also internal violence of the spirit. You not only refuse to shoot a man, you refuse to hate him. So finding a way not to slot into the easy, oh, they're all nasty, let's all be nasty at them too, and becoming part of the problem. And in the book, there's a, there's a section of a chapter which actually explores the future of Israel-Palestine as well, where the women's movement gets together and explores how they can cooperate to produce a solution for Israel-Palestine, which I don't have time to go into today, but it's in the book. <laughs> so then the, the first O for the democracy crisis created the O for open democracy. And the, sim the solutions here are, um, well, before I get to the solutions, um, this 2011 World Values Survey found that 34% of Americans Approve of having a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress or elections. 42% among those with no education beyond high school. This is fairly scary when you think how much work went in to create democracy, and they're saying, oh, it doesn't matter, just give us a strong leader. Um, and this is what we're flirting with here, the danger that if we don't really strengthen democracy. So we have to awaken the spirit of democracy, and there are ways of doing that. Um, to get the instinct to vote out there. So first of all, reducing the voting age to 16. It's become normal in the future. People are doing their first election while they're at school. They're in the habit of voting from the age of 16. There is a $100 voting tax credit. as a little incentive. If you don't vote, you lose it. But it's just something to sweeten the pie. There's electronic voting. This is fine in Canada because our electoral commissions are nonpartisan and trustworthy. In America, they're not trustworthy, so it's something you might not want to do. Um, getting the money out of politics, another real big change here. And 86% um, of British Columbians you know, today support a ban on corporate and union political donations, including 81% of our conservative voters who are in the Liberal Party. So it's a very strong consensus. And then a 70% of Canadians today want to support change to proportional voting, which has happened in the future. So we've, we've got that change to proportional voting. There is a new government that formed in British Columbia as a coalition of um, the, the Greens and the New Democrats working together. And so a lot of the changes that came that are very practical were also voted through as bills in the legislature and in the, in the parliament in Canada. So now we come to the economic crisis, which is a big thing because we're talking about really changing the whole nature of the way we work. So the, the name of the, the problem here is, is neoliberalism, which dominates us. So neoliberalism, very successful at generating wealth, but at the same time it's destroying nature enabling tax havens, which increase inequality, it's destroying jobs, it's generating anger, it's pleasing the corporations and corrupting governments. So it's a bit of a problem. And when we wonder what is it that's driving this endless you know, consumption of nature and destruction of nature, it does have a name. It, that name is neoliberalism. And a lot of people are feeling left out, which is why they're wanting strong leaders like Donald Trump, like the people behind the Brexit campaign in Britain, say, we feel abandoned, we feel we're not getting on with stuff, where's our new economy, and it isn't happening for them. And so we're dealing with a, what Patrick finds is a contrast between corporate, pl corporate plutocracy and social democracy. And that's the struggle between two forms of an economy, that, that, um, because basically capitalism isn't working. So now, I'm rolling in, in the solutions. We're rolling the M for meaningful work, just to simplify it for this talk, and E for a new economy together. And we're talking about transformation, so the way, you know, eight ways that capitalism is being transformed into a green, entrepreneurial, cooperative, caring economy. I'm so repeating that because each of these four words is really important. And that's the eight themes, strengthening entrepreneurialism, transforming the corporation, transforming banking, reducing poverty and inequality, respecting nature, protecting public ownership, a new global financial architecture, and green sustainable economics. So strengthening entrepreneurialism is really important because without business, you really haven't got an economy. And one of the weaknesses of old-fashioned socialism is they thought business is just nasty capitalists trying to exploit us. But you take away business, there's nothing happening. Business allows people to take risk, to be creative, to express themselves, and frankly, to create amazing things. Because of that risk and the willingness to do it, 
you know, we live in a world hugely, you know, enhanced because of the power of business, but we need to basically train new entrepreneurs, not just assume that if your father was in business, you know how to business. So, you know, getting ways to get outside the normal rut and have new people trained to run businesses. We need to have youth enterprise units, well, I should say, Patrick found them happening in all the schools in the future. So there were teenagers learning to how to run their own businesses. When I was involved in the unemployment scene in, Br in Britain in the 1980s, every high school had a, un had a youth enterprise project happening, not taught by the teachers at all, but the, the kids do it themselves because they're starting their own business, mentored by people from, from the Chamber of Commerce coming in as volunteers. They're learning what it means to run a business. And then also a big emphasis on starting new cooperatives. And the great example for cooperatives is a place called Mondragon in the Basque country of northern Spain, where there's you know, a network of 257 linked up cooperatives, all based on a philosophy of participation and solidarity, operating since the 1950s. 85,000 employees, um, 7,500 students, all part of a, a big network called Mondragon, where they own their own shares in their own cooperatives. And their unemployment rate is only 8% when Spain was at 25%. And their average wage ratio is between 1 to 3 and 1 to 9, versus here in North America, it's like 1 to 350 with the big corporate CEOs. And when the economy you know, crunches by 10%, they all take 10% less hours to work. They don't fire 10% of the workers, because they're all friends in this together. And it's also, when Patrick gets to the future, an emphasis on social enterprise, community organized businesses, community development corporations, ways of using the business model to meet community needs. As, for instance, this example in Cape Breton of New Dawn, where you know, they've been going for, I think, 30, 40, 50 years now, maybe. You know, they saw a need for rental properties. They created them. They saw a need for health care. They organized it. They see a need for Meals on Wheels. They do it. So they got you know, 170 people employed in a community-owned business where the shareholders are in the community itself. So we could have community businesses in Nanaimo, in Ladysmith, in Duncan, in Vancouver, in Courtney, like that. Another thrust when we're starting new businesses is that in the future, green business certification has become absolutely normal. Same way today, we, we know accountancy certification is normal. You've got to get an accountant to do your books, make sure you're not fiddling. Green business certification pioneered right here in, on Vancouver Island by Jill Doucette and her team at Synergy in Victoria. There are around 90 businesses certified as green already on Vancouver Island. In the future, they're all certified as green because that became the law and that's, you know, the businesses were given, you know, three years notice to get up to snatch and do it, but it becomes expected that you are operating in harmony with nature through green business certification. And also the business is increasingly using the triple bottom line of thinking about the planet and the people as well as their profits. Now, the other interesting thing we found, which was a, a new one, it, businesses are cooperating together. Now, this, the core of this evidence comes from a district in Italy called Emilia Romagna, which is south of Venice and north of Florence in there. Population the same as British Columbia, 4 million or so. It's among the top 10 regions of Europe. They've got 32% self-employed people, huge number of working in small businesses, huge number of enterprises and cooperatives. But they have this tradition of mutual support and reciprocity, and they all pay 0.4% levy into a collective organizational form which helps with training, which helps with research and development, it helps with credit, it helps with all sorts of stuff. As a result of that mutual cooperation, they have the lowest unemployment in Italy and the highest rate of citizen satisfaction. This becomes really important when you look at why people are feeling let down by neoliberalism. Say in Britain we know about with the Brexit vote, in America because of the support for Trump. And here's the thing, in a, in a social democracy, a successful regional economy, starting from the bottom, has excellent high school and higher education, K-12 and higher education, supportive neighborhoods, smart, supportive governments, effective affordable housing policies, strong crop and business networks, strong umbrella organizations like the one that they give the 0.4% to, and then supportive banking. So all of those things support a business culture. So there's no neighborhood just getting left out and neglected and feeling pathetic. When you do look at the same thing in a, in a neoliberal plutocracy, you've got weak education, weak neighborhoods, weak governments, few affordable housing projects, policies, weak co-op and business networks, no umbrella organizations, and banking for the rich. So it's no wonder that people get left out and feel that this big new economy is not helping them. So this is the kind of change that Patrick found in the future where the economy was strong and thriving. So then we come to the next big thing of transforming the corporation. So a corporation can do amazing stuff. This Ray Anderson, who founded the carpet company called Interface, 
was running a regular carpet company. Then he read this book by Paul Hawking called The Ecology of Commerce, which spelt out the impact of business on the environment. He said it was like a, a spear in his heart. He's like, oh my God, I'm responsible for all that. So he changed his whole company around. So his vision of success now is if you're successful in his company, we'll spend the rest of our days harvesting yesteryear's carpets to recycle them into new materials, converting sunlight into energy with zero scrap to the landfill and zero emissions to the ecosystem. That's the vision, a business that's in complete harmony with nature's rhythms, where there is no waste at all. Other corporations, however, are operating on the old principles where you know, the rule that the corporate director must maximize shareholder value is the, is the governing one. And this was well covered in the movie called The Corporation, which basically you know, showed how people are driven to be almost psychopathic and sociopathic because you know, they've got to maximize profits. So that what Patrick finds in the future no, is there's a lot of benefit corporations. In fact, 75% of the big businesses in Vancouver in the future have become benefit corporations where they change the legal charter of the company. So they now have a legal requirement to create a benefit for the community or a benefit for the environment. And, and the whole de definition of fiduciary trust is changed to be no longer fixated just on making money. There's a bigger game at hand. And right today in Vancouver, there's around 25 benefit corporations already established. So in the future, there's many, many more because of supportive policies that encourage them. He also finds that in the future, many more women involved. And when more women are on the boards of directors, the data shows that you get better financial performance. And it basically goes down to hormones. When too many men get together, all our hormones get crazy. Let's do a crazy risk thing. That sounds good. Have a pint, celebrate. And it doesn't pan out. Women are saying, no, no, no let's look at the long term. Let's balance this more. I don't, this audience is mostly women, so you're all happy with that message, right? <laughs> so now we're looking at how banking is transformed in the future as well. This is um, the Triodos Bank in Holland, the world's greenest bank, where they only lend to activities that are restorative of nature and restorative community. They're not lending anything else at all. And then we have Van City, which we take for granted as a regular unit, but Van City is fantastic. The fact that it's managed by a socially responsible board through annual elections, 500,000 members, returning 5 million to the members every year, which otherwise would go off in private profits to the, to the shareholders. But Van City has a very active election process. A lot of our other credit unions don't, and so they're really following the old model and not being anywhere near as progressive as Van City is. And the banks in future are also doing micro-lending, so that if you, if you haven't got any capital, you've got no collateral, you can still take out a loan, pioneered in, in, in Bangladesh by Muhammad Yunus, now spread to you know, villages all over the world. And there is public banking. And Patrick had never heard of public banking when he got to the future. It doesn't really exist today, but actually 40% of the, world, the banks in the world are public banks, owned by governments, doing banking in the normal way. And why this is relevant is, is to do with how money gets created. This is the governor of the Bank of England explaining how money gets created. So you can't, this is, the, this is the real thing. When banks extend loans to their customers, they create money by crediting their customers' accounts. That's all. They don't have to phone up the Bank of Canada to say, can you print me another $10,000 to give out? They just click a little switch. And as long as they've got enough you know, baseload reserves for a fractional reserve to allow them to lend, they just create the money out of thin air. And they lend it out at interest, and the interest lends profits to the bank's private shareholders. When a public bank creates money, the money interest returns to the public for use in healthcare, in education, whatever you want to be. The model for public banking that Patrick learned is actually the Bank of North Dakota, established almost 100 years ago um, as a result of a big populist uprising, and so successful that the Wall Street Journal said it's more profitable than Goldman Sachs, better credit rating than JP Morgan and Chase. So what, when the Bank of British Columbia was created in 2018, it stores the government to crown, revenue, crown agency revenues. It creates new money by the act of lending, saves taxpayers on interest costs, eliminates billions in bank fees, and then it uses its lending to lend out to other banks who can then support the transition to clean energy, building retrofits for you know, action on farms, helping First Nations projects, all that sort of stuff. And also, when there's a, a dip in the economy, they can create more money to help counter that dip. And also, the Bank of Canada in 2032 has reinstated the powers it had, or the powers it always, had always had, it's publicly owned, and during the 1950s and 60s and 70s, well, no, but 74, the Bank of Canada printed money or created money out of thin air to, to build the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans-Canada Highway. So now they're doing that again to help finance and transition, for instance, to 100% renewable energy. The fourth theme of transforming the economy is reducing poverty and inequality. 
um, which is a really big issue if you know what's happening there. And one of these pieces is simply the abolition of student debt. Clearing that out entirely, using a model developed in Oregon, where it's going through the state legislature now in 2016, whereby education is free, but when you finish, you pay 3% of your income for the next 21 years into a fund to pay for the, all the future education of future students. So if you work in Walmart, you pay 3% of your Walmart income. If you work on Wall Street, you pay 3% of your Wall Street income. So it's eminently fair, and that enables the student debt to be eliminated. The, the minimum wage has also been introduced and an increase, so it's $23 minimum wage, so there's no more people struggling at $10, 25 an hour, and just really impossible to make ends meet. And um, there's basic income guarantee for everyone called citizen's income in the future, being discussed right now by uh, countries in Europe, whether every citizen in Canada, unconditionally, whether rich or poor, gets around $1,000 a month, re replacing a lot of other benefits. If you're super wealthy, it all gets taxed back. But it removes the sense of people really living precariously, never knowing where they, how they're going to pay the hydro bill, where they get the food from, how they pay the rent, living in constant distress of eviction and the hydro being cut off, financed in part by the existing um, benefits and financed in part by progressive tax reform. There are also lots of community currencies happening where people coming out of the crisis that happened in the, after the big crash in 2018 or so and then in the following years, people saw they still have skills so they can set up a currency to trade skills among themselves and they can create that currency out of thin air as they've done in Bristol, England. So that helps people's activity keep rolling. And the First Nations have had a lot of activity during this period, weaving a whole new paradigm um, of success instead of sort of moving away from the past. So um, this, for instance, is the Souk the Nation solar project down um, in Souk near Victoria, where they really pioneered the use of solar and doing a lot of other things with their own greenhouse. So some First Nations breakthroughs. In 2032, we've got 25 First Nations members of parliament. BC's premier is a First Nations woman. They've had free college education long before the big arrangement I just discussed was put through. The land treaty's been signed across the country. The First Nations people becoming professionals, teachers, lawyers, doctors. And the West Shore Coal Terminal at Sawasan um, there's no need for any coal exports anymore because no one's using coal. So that land is given back or taken back by the Sawasan First Nations and used to create a beautiful cultural heritage center celebrating the history of First Nations since the time of arrival. And the causeway becomes a tidal energy gathering place, right? So huge potential in the future. The fifth theme for the new economy is treating nature as a being to respect instead of a re resource to exploit and building an ecological economy. And I can only cover this very briefly here because it's got a lot of themes in it, including taxing in nature's external costs through things like carbon taxes and pesticide taxes, 100% sustainable fisheries, forestry, energy, farming, and zero waste. So we not have any more landfills or incineration. We've learned to recycle our waste entirely. And 100% um, organic farming. Now, when Patrick was um, having a conversation with Aaliyah, who's a Syrian Canadian nurse in the book about, she was doing her shopping online, and he said, you know, how much of it's organic? Because and, and, in his time, like maybe three or four percent. And she said, well, it's all organic. And he said, well, how did that happen? He said, well, she said, well, the government was so concerned about the cost of the conventional farming, which is the nitrogen runoff pollution into the lakes and rivers, the, the pesticide use, the, um, the pollution of our own immune systems because of the things we'd taken in, the climate impact, the cancers, that they said, let's put a tax on pesticides and fertilizers and give 100% of the revenue to the farmers to make the transition to organic over a three-year period, and the yields are the same. So the farmers said, that's a good deal because I no longer have to worry about pesticides. I get the birds and the bees back. So automatically, there's no more threat to the bees because all the pesticides are gone on the farms. There's also a shift to all forestry in Canada being managed under Forest Stewardship Council with sustainable standards. And there's a, an increase in marine protected areas in the oceans, where, which are totally off-limit for fishing at all, allowing the fish to become really fertile. And the, 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 the spin-off from that in the non-protected areas allows enough fish for sustainable fisheries around the world. And then there's a change in the way we measure progress. Because the red line shows the gross domestic product rising steadily, but the green line shows what's called genuine progress. And we've not seen any increase in genuine progress since the 1970s, really. So now we're measuring gross national happiness as well as gross domestic product. So we, you can target policies, like what does it take? If that 5% are really unhappy, what is going wrong? How do we change the policies to make them happy? Protecting public ownership and the role of governments, the sixth theme in changing the economy. And the key, one of the key things here is coming from the work of a, a British-Italian economist called Mariano Mazzucato, who 
her book called The Entrepreneurial State really reveals how when it comes to the big, complex pieces of technology, like the iPhone, the, the key breakthroughs were done by government-sponsored research and development in the States. Apple may claim it's a, it's a victory for self-employed capitalism, whatever, but it's not. Without government research at the difficult end, it doesn't happen. So you have to embrace the role of government sponsoring research and development in the universities and in special laboratories. So now we're adding to the regular, in a mixed social democracy economy, we're adding affordable housing, public banking, and research and development to the other things that we've already socialized in Canada, like healthcare and education. Then briefly, we need a new global architecture, which is all rolling out in the future. The tax havens have been abolished entirely in the future. They no longer exist. They're a, they're a parasitic cancer on the, on the planet. And the Panama Papers you know, reveal how much money is being you know, hidden away illegally. These two books were my key reading. The Treasure Islands that lays out how it's all happening. And I, I, Nicholas Shaxon advised me on some of the stuff for that in the future. And this new book by Gabriel Zuckman basically shows how you can actually eliminate the tax savings by having a single global financial registry of, of financial transactions. And when a country refuses to take part because oh, we're Barbados or we're Cayman Islands, we don't want to bother, you have a, a trade tariffs against that country. So for Switzerland, which is the core of the tax avoiding monster here, a 33% trade tariff by Germany, Italy and France against Switzerland's exports will quickly make Switzerland come to its senses and close down the small part of its economy enabling tax evasion for everyone from you know, super corrupt plutocrats to drug barons and, and corrupt politicians in Africa, all of whom are just ripping off the planet. There's also a change from free trade to fair trade. Um, Naomi Klein did us, a, did us a big service in her book, This Changes Everything, by spelling out in detail how when we look at climate treaties, they're all essentially voluntary for the biggest crisis we face. But trade treaties come with big tribunals and penalties and costs. And under NAFTA, corporations can sue you know, for losses. And this is exactly what happened right now when um, TransCanada has just filed the $15 billion lawsuit to say, we want all that money from you, America, because you shut down the Keystone Pipeline. That's the, the kind of, that has to be changed. So actually what happens is in 2025, there's a global fair, treaty, fair trade treaty agreed to when we change all the rules of trade. Then finally, in the universities, we're moving, there's a new green sustainable economics with some of the new texts that are really informing the way economics is changing and some of the, the new thinkers being taken instead of the old-fashioned economics, which just spreads mirable thinking. So in addition to this, we've got the ecological crisis. This is all under the, um, this is part of the G for a green future, but I'm fitting it in here. Um, and one of the things in the future describing, you cannot get to college without doing Ecology 101 in school. And that happened not because the school said, let's do this thing, but because three universities, UBC, University of Toronto, and UVic got together and said, you know, starting in three years' time, unless you do Ecology 101, you can't come to university. So the school simply had to scramble. The parents were phoning them up saying, just do it, right? So because right now, in today's time, we've got cabinet ministers, well, maybe not anymore, we had cabinet ministers who didn't know what the carbon cycle is. I mean, it's just, we have business CEOs who don't know what the carbon cycle is, or ignorant of fundamental you know, ecological facts. Um, we also have tr very practical transformations, like we're used to seeing ordinary gray buildings like this. Well, in the future, a company called Green Ever Gray is transforming them. This is right now's change because we've learned how to do this, to bring nature back into the cities along with the bees and the birds and the butterflies. And the creeks that are covered in concrete are all being restored. So, you know, salmon that haven't been around for 80 years are now getting back into the creeks. The, the children in the schools are out there helping to restore the creeks. And the herring that were once super abundant, you know, for 10,000 years, ever since the Ice Age, there were herring everywhere. Then we overfished the herrings. We just got greedy. We took in much too much with clever technology. And then we, then we put creosote on the pilings. And when the herring lay the eggs on the creosote, the eggs die, there's no herrings. So in today's time, in Squamish, the Squamish stream keepers are wrapping the pilings to create safe habitat for herring spawn. And the herring eggs are now all surviving. They're having fantastic return of the herring in Squamish. So in the future, this is happening through Alps Falls Creek and all the docks and things around the Fraser River. Huge return of herring. And with them comes the, 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 the humpback whales doing bubble feeding in the way that they've done for the last 10,000 years until we started overfishing and doing creosote. So there's kind of ways in which nature is being restored. And the ocean cleanup is underway with new technologies to try and get that plastic out of the ocean to stop the threat to creatures like this. And there's more marine reserves, as I've um, already explained. And the, the blue dot movement that David Suzuki's been leading has got this, the, the right to clean air, the right to clean water, the, in char built into Canada's Charter of Rights. So it becomes something we can take for granted. Our children won't have to put up with pollution. 
Now, because I'm focusing on the economy side, the, the, I want to also include the affordable housing crisis. This is just, Patrick was living in Vancouver, you know, before he went out there, so we know the scale of this thing. It's just crazy. This comes under the A for affordable living. 91% of homes, all those homes in red, are priced over a million in Vancouver right now, right? Um, in January of 2016, that little house was selling for 1.18, no, 1.85 million. There's a typo there. But um, in June, this little house was selling for 5.5 million. You can buy a house like this in the Nimo for maybe 250,000 right now if you move quickly, probably not tomorrow. <laughs> so there's something really, really wrong here. And, and if you do buy in at those high levels, a massive debt burden. In the 1970s, you could, to, you could spend seven years saving enough money to put a deposit to buy a house. Today in Vancouver, it takes 23 years to save the money to put a deposit down. So something severely wrong with all this. And families really struggling with the need to have a home and the rental crisis becoming all this, feeding the homelessness crisis. So the core problem is too much money pouring into the market. And it's coming from inheritances, it's coming from foreign money overseas, and it's coming from tax evading money, so which is inflating prices. So in the, in the Panama Papers, every single dot here shows a tax evading address listed in the Panama Papers, where someone has got a shell company set up to buy property to avoid taxes. 15 times more in um, Metro Vancouver than, say, in Edmonton. So we know that this is happening. And I think this is such a big crisis that you know, the, the, the changes that Patrick found in 2032 are similar to the changes that happened in Saskatchewan that co created Canada's um, socialized health care. So we was basically a similar set of changes for affordable housing voted in here in July 2018. And they start with restricting foreign ownership. By one way or another, we've got to find ways to restrict foreign ownership. And then it, we look at this core crisis, that two-thirds of Canadians have parents who own property. They will inherit. One-third of Canadians don't have parents who own property. They're never going to inherit. They'll be renting all their lives, and the gap between the non-renters and the property the renters and the non-renters gets bigger and bigger as the housing price. So you're locking a third of Canadians into a constantly renting reality when they're constantly feeding money to people on the property-owning side of the divide. So this is really harmful. So the fundamental solution that Patrick found was that people were gathering a huge pool of new revenues and building tons of new affordable housing. The new money, it's coming from... Um, 10 to 20,000 units a year is really what's needed. That's the speed at which building's been happening. An affordable housing tax levy, similar to what Seattle has been doing for the last 30 years, which has enabled them to build 12,000 units in their city at below market rents. Escalating taxes on properties left empty, which is supported by you know, a huge number of the public. Um, affordable housing tax on Airbnbs, because two-thirds of the Airbnbs are for whole houses or apartments that would otherwise um, those are all Airbnbs, otherwise be in the permanent rental pool. They've been taken out of the rental pool, so the rental vacancy rate's down to 0.6. Massive struggle to find a place to rent. Escalating property transfer tax on top-end real estate sales. A speculation tax on properties that are flipped within a year purely to make money. A tax on homes bought through offshore tax havens before they're closed down. An inheritance tax on estates above a certain value, wider than the current capital gains tax on just half the properties increase. So all that money is poured into an affordable housing land reserve, established equivalent to the agricultural land reserve, to build more housing and, and to, to give you know, developers incentives to build 100% rental properties, such as you know, whether it's container homes like from shipping containers costing 85,000, looking quite attractive if you can't afford a big house, car-free laneway housing, because the transport's so good with good transit, bike sharing, car sharing, you don't need to own your own car anymore, so it's not a parking problem. And um, for, for, for people really struggling with homelessness still, put, allowing tiny home zones on land that's temporarily vacant, as they're already doing you know, in Washington, D.C. So that basically has solved the housing problem in the future because of the, you know, the restriction on the prices by all the new taxes and the massive building of affordable housing, all done to the passive housing standard. In addition to that, there's the crisis parallel called the loss of community, which is addressed also by the A for affable living, so what Patrick discovers is on the streets where he goes, is a phenomenal rebuilding of a sense of community and neighborhood and people working together, um, organizing things together, having potlucks together, transition streets programs that let people sort of talk to their neighbors and work on changes, potlucks I mentioned, um, setting up community notice boards, community libraries, 
holding a community feast the first August or the first weekend in August in the future is it is it's street party day. So everyone is having a street party on that one day. All the streets are blocked off because celebrating is one of the oldest traditions in humanity. We've always taken time to have big old festivals, get the music out, have fun together, right? Neighborhood tool sharing, instead of ever having a garage full of equipment they hardly ever use, and then transforming the actual streets in the neighborhoods, as they're doing in Portland, Oregon, where neighbors had no meeting place, so they created a meeting place out of thin air. They just, let's make our place here where we can gather and, and enjoy ourselves. And then another approach to this, this is Hamburg, where they have a, a plan to make the whole city car-free by 2020. That highway completely divides the city, so it, they're almost talking to each other on either side of that road. And they can't eliminate it because it goes right through Germany, but they're, going to, they're paving the whole thing over, all three kilometers of it. So now you've got food being grown, people wandering around, falling in love with each other, connecting marriages, children, across that divide that otherwise broke the city up. And that's the plan for how they're going to do the whole thing. So this sense of, of change with auto-dominated urban designs, people disconnect. There's less sense of neighborhood and less mutual support. With social urban designs, we connect more, we talk to each other, there's a stronger sense of neighborhood because the car isn't in the way. With sort of the neighborhood, the way the houses are laid out enables us and encourages us to talk to each other and connect because we're doing stuff on foot instead of going straight to the garage. And uh, this is a more common in the future as a way of, of developing. So here we see, you know, the cars are parked off to one side, but we're connecting on foot. And when you pass someone on foot, if I'm coming out here, so if I'm, I'm coming to you for the first time, we haven't met before, say, hi, I'm Guy. Maureen. Maureen. Now we're connecting, right? Whenever I see you again in future, I'm g we're going to see each other. If I just walk past like a zombie, you're going to think, oh my God, did I not go to the bathroom? What's wrong, right? <laughs> it's a human instinct to connect. But when we're just passing in cars, there's a, there's a rule of thumb that if you have um, new neighbors moving in, and you don't greet them within three weeks to say hello, you're both so embarrassed that you haven't spoken to each other that 10 years later you're still not speaking to each other. Because it's like, oh, it feels wrong. But how do I start speaking to someone I've not spoken to for 10 years? So community, community, community becomes really important in all this. Building designs that encourage human connection. This is like, whether it's a rural development like this outside the city of Grass in Austria. Or, you know, and being funky with architecture. You know, having fun, getting rid of all the straight lines. This is on the, the Austrian architect Hundertwasser. Just being creative with the way designs are done and bringing color back into everything. Having, you know, there's an architectural explosion of creativity happening. And then st regular streets, this is in Paris, where they said, let's just try it, see what it's like as a, for a week, put, turn it into a park. And bringing art into the community, bringing celebration, or, you know, big, wonderful murals, and just boring sets of stairs. You can get a pot of paint out and just transform things. And it just changes the way we feel about our cities. And people are talking to each other. This is in Vic West, where they had a transition street project, and they worked together. Boring concrete wall. So get out the paintbrush, get an artist, and the, the chicken eats the VW. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in Vancouver right now, where it says, we take care of each other. That's the fundamental impulse that's happening in the neighborhoods of the future. And um, that's the way it gets celebrated in the, in the parks as well. So it's parks for the seniors. So that's the end of part one of my presentation. So <laughs> a lot of material. Let's have um, 10 minutes for questions and thoughts and stuff like that. Now, there's a microphone at the back. If you want to be courageous, come up and share your thoughts and whatever you want. I just want to talk a bit about the uh, cooperative economic opportunities that are mentioned in the book here and some of what's going on locally in, in Nanaimo uh, to meet the demand. And this is happening spontaneously all over the place. So. Um, we've got the farmers markets here happening and uh, expanding all the time. So the Island Roots Market Co-op has sprung up just over the last two years and started a winter farmers market. Uh, and they're now partnering with the, the Bone Road Farmers Market and uh, starting two markets per week. So Wednesday, uh, 4 to 6.30 and uh, on sa uh, Saturday morning. Yeah. Um, so from uh, 10 to 12 you can go and get fresh local food. Fantastic. It's also happening in Lanceville and in uh, Cedar there. Yeah. So we've, we've got uh, that happening. Now also some friends are working with uh, another uh, co-op farm 
a farm ship out in Cedar, and it's employing young people to be getting into farming. And That's great. So this is an economic opportunity happening here. There's also a maker space in Nanaimo, which is like uh, people getting together to share tools, to build stuff. There's the Nanaimo uh, Hub City Cycles, which is a bicycle co-op. A Nanaimo Car Share, which is a, a car share platform. So a lot of these different things are, are happening in, in our community. And, yeah. and that's Everything's b building on this, but uh, yeah, if you could speak a bit more yeah. about that and the economics at play here, I think it's the biggest well, the thing. Well, the interesting thing is that w when I was, this is me speaking personally about writing the book, not Patrick, this was three and a half years' work, and it's just packed full of innovations like that, and they're all, all the innovations in the book are based, like you say, on stuff happening already today. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's 940 endnotes when you can see exactly where they're happening, and it just says, if you took all these initiatives and let them grow and then cooperate together, what would the future look like? And that's what the book shows. And the, the economic benefit, the jobs had, the flourishing of the local economy because of the kind of things you're talking about. So that's just great. Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm Michael Meta from Gabriola Island. Thank you, Guy, for the wonderful talk. As you know, uh, in the last couple of years in this part of the province, there's been a, a renaissance of solar photovoltaic companies in, in the region. In the last two years, six alone have sprung up in this part of Vancouver Island. And you're starting to see solar on rooftops, you're starting to see people talk about it more often, and of course people are starting to uh, understand that there's a, uh, something that they personally can do to make a difference. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in, in spite of the fact that there's almost zero government support for this, what do you think we can do to stimulate government to be a little bit more proactive, to help people, to create incentives, to maybe encourage banks to give better loans for people who want to put in systems like this, and to, to really bump start it? Because we need to start seeing almost every public building, like libraries, schools, hospitals, you name it, being leaders uh, in this yeah. area, so that when we drive down the road, it's be the new norm. So, so part two of my presentation goes into the solar revolution as part of the way we're tackling climate change. Um, and it's an inevitable technology. It, it just, it's rolling along as the price falls so steadily. And so as the price falls, the economics get better and better. And actually on Gabriola, where you come from, there's been some pioneering done to drive down that price through community application of skills to do that. And I think that the, the lesson, if anything, is just the, the conversational thing. On, on, on Salt Spring, they got a massive, a huge growth of electric cars because they talk to each other and they normalize it. So when neighbors talk to each other and they see that solar roof and they see what it cost and they learned how difficult it was or not, I haven't come across people finding a difficulty with financing. And I don't see, this may sound contradictory, I don't see a role for the government to support this because wind energy is still three times cheaper than solar energy. So putting so subsidies for solar energy would make the wind industry very upset. The best thing we need to do is stop the Site C dam from being built, because that's a very destructive way of generating new power, primarily for, for fracking in British Columbia. And it's, it's sucking up all the demand for other forms of new energy. But the solar revolution is going to roll along because we don't need any permission to do it. You can just, if you've got a sun, a roof with good sun exposure, you can call up a company like, you know, and, and do it. So every, every roof in the future is covered in solar. The price is down to $1.50 per watt in the future, as I'll show in the part two of this. But thanks. Yeah, I, and I think you know a big part of this fundamental shift that we're going to start to see is that uh, energy, which has always been intricately tied to our economy, will actually have a more embedded sort of context at the regional level. I mean, Site C, as you mentioned, is pretty much uh, you know going to create some employment through construction jobs in the early years, but a, a hydro project only really employs a handful of people when it's operating. Yeah. Whereas a renewable energy economy, solar, wind, micro, whatever it happens to be, will create jobs for installers, designers. Mm -hmm site assessors, sales associates, maintain people who do the maintenance work, the technical work, all across this province. So it will be a big, yeah. play a big role in what you're talking about in terms of that community development. But linked to that, here on Vancouver Island, not only are we shipping 95% of our food in on the ferry, which makes us very vulnerable, but most of our power is coming in on two big cables under the ocean. So, so Will, if there was a big earthquake and those got ruptured, we'd be stuck. So the more solar there is, you know, and the more wind there is on the island, the more we're self-sufficient in power on the island, which gives us more resilience. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else want to? Yes, Lynn. Lynn Burroughs from Nanaimo. Can you um, speak up a bit? Yes. Great. Uh, Guy, thank you so much for, for this book and for bringing to the forefront all these things that are happening all over the world that we can get visions of and get hope from and and 
work work towards every all these things here locally and beyond yeah, so thanks. again thank you it's so important to give people positive vision and it's so important people have their you know they can't see they can't hear they're scared to yeah. death but you've given people a lot of hope with your book yeah, thanks what i find I, I give talks in high schools and typically i'll get the whole school on the floor of the gym and at the beginning I'll, i say to them when you think about the future of our planet what do you feel hope or worry out of 400 kids, five hands go up to say they feel hopeful. Then I give a slideshow equivalent to this, targeted for schools and teenagers, full of solutions and practical stuff, mostly focused on the climate crisis, on the ocean's plastics crisis. Then I ask them the same question again, and I show how they can get careers in this field, how there are teenage leaders, and half the hands go up. And all I've done is show them photographs of change that's already happening and give them some sort of a pep talk of belief in themselves. And the teachers are coming. I'm saying, well, I wish I could do this too, but I'm not being told this information. They don't know that it's happening. This is the biggest problem, that we've got this epidemic of hopelessness happening in the schools, which probably underpins, their, if they're teenagers or being bullied and got family problems, and they feel the future's hopeless, they're going to start thinking you know, about bad things. And so we really need the teachers to understand this power of a new vision and not just be caught up in the headlights of doom and gloom. Because reading the papers all the time, you might think that everything is collapse and doom and gloom. But so much is actually happening in a positive way that we don't hear about in the normal media. So yeah. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Reed, Reed Thorburn. Uh, I've got a couple of points. Um, one, I think everybody that has means should invest in a new energy um, but the other question I have is, um, last fall I was listening to the Shaw Von Palmer show, political yes. show, and he had a BC cabinet minister on, I think he might have been the energy minister, and he said that this natural gas play, the fracking play that they're proposing, yes. would provide enough natural gas for 85 years. Now, he, he said that like 85 years is a long time. To me, it's just not a long time. Yeah. Um, my family's been on Vancouver Island more than 100 years working in the same industry, and so, okay. Could you comment on that? I mean, that's, yeah. that's my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, and then no more gas, yeah. and then no more oil. Yeah, it's crazy. The I mean, I, 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 I don't think Bill Bennett, the energy minister, would question my saying this, but he's, he's got questions around the reality of climate change. From stuff he said to me, he's not at all convinced that climate change is happening. So if you don't think there's a climate problem, why would you not exploit a fossil fuel and get lots of money from it? Um, when you realize how big the climate crisis is, as we'll see in part two, you realize really quickly that it's really foolish when you've got a fire to fight the fire by pouring more gas onto it. And all liquid natural gas comes from fracking, which has been banned in France, banned in Germany, banned in New York, you know, increasingly coming under pressure because it toxifies the water where the thing takes place. And when you've got such a rapid transition happening into renewable energy and the move to 100% renewable energy, which is the future of our economy, why would you make old-fashioned promises like that? So I think it's just there's no ideas left in the bank of the cabinet. They're just grabbing for what they've got because they're not well enough, they're not confident enough in the change that's happening. And they've got too much money in politics, which I describe, you know, affecting them with donations from fossil fuel companies. That's my take on it, and there's certainly people watching this program who are going to have a different take on it. It's one of those things you have lively discussions on. Yeah. Yeah, another question. Uh, I sit on a couple of different committees in this new city to me, three years. And uh, it's pretty obviously, provincially and municipally and regionally, that uh, we tend to elect people who are not always the best leaders of our community. Uh, when you when you put your name forward, uh, you know, like, and you come to a job to represent uh, your constituents, uh, people forget that they need to think of all constituents and that they need to think and learn, you know, what can be changed or what needs to be changed. And a, a lot of people, a lot of politicians, are influenced by big business. So whether it's the cha local chamber or the downtown Nanaimo Business Association or Improvement Association, uh, you know, like or, or provincially by other organizations, 
the, the problem is, is that if we don't take that money and that pressure out, and if we don't organize ourselves, that is not going to change. Government has to have a role in that because government has the money to make those kind of changes yeah. and, and to uh, employ industries that do not destroy our yeah. planet. Uh, right now, what, what we're seeing uh, with our politicians is that they bicker among themselves and that we are, for instance, people of the Green Party are not getting elected. So if we want to make changes, it starts at home first. So if you use plastic bottles, okay, you got to stop doing that. If you shop at Canadian Tire, stop doing that. Because if you look at every Canadian Tire ad, every device that needs electricity is being taken out in nature. Okay, so if I go camping, I need to have my, my latte, etc. you know, like all of those things. And so we need to stop yeah. doing that, you know, because yeah. we keep on destroying the planet. Let me respond. Your, your comments on the councillors are interesting because I've certainly noticed that in the Nanaimo region, but I've lived in Victoria 25 years, and I've seen how people have, who hold a positive vision of a, a better future have been running for council and getting elected. So now the councils in Vancouver, in Victoria, in Esquimalt, in Souk, in Saanich, have a, a majority of people thinking progressively in the same kind of way. And really, it shows that money was not the problem. It was just community organizing to get the vote out for those candidates. And someone like yourself saying, I'm going to run for council. <laughs> because unless someone with the thinking runs for council, you haven't any chance of being elected. And I've seen it happen in the Greater Victoria region and in Vancouver. But thanks for your question. I've been sort of working on, in the background, trying to influence our politicians to make the right decisions yeah. and, and to actually inform themselves before they come to that decision. Yeah. And then I go to the council meetings and I watch them turn down uh, developers that want to develop a big uh, rental property, but because there is not enough car parking lots, they get turned down. Yeah, no, that's and not, I that's go, not you know, this is totally against you your, to, your, your, your plan, your transportation I know, but plan. But it means that councillors have to have the courage what happens in Victoria, because I, I established the Victoria Car Share Co-op when we have a similar projects. The, the, the parking requirements are being reduced because the car share cooperative can come in and offer membership to people, and so you have less parking requirements. So there are very practical ways. Otherwise, this is what the engineers say it's got to be done, and the councillors rarely want to fight with their engineers unless you find a practical solution. So but we need, we need to wind up because I think our hour is up very quickly. Right. So what, what we really need is all kinds of different organizations that sort of have similar ideas to bind you know, in, in a group to approach uh, councillors, yeah. etc., and make the changes. Yeah. Because right now we don't get the changes because yeah. everybody and is sort of running in all kinds of directions. Yeah, and part two of this talk you know, covers that stuff as well as the climate crisis and this whole thing of how we're rediscovering hope and purpose on the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. You can clap now. <laughs>